this is to again to inspire you defense lawyers you can make these arguments and you can win on them this is what the judge said quote it is the finding of this court that the conditions to which the defendant was sub subjected are as disgusting inhuman as anything i've heard about any colombian prison but more so because we're supposed to be better than that. I think you've suffered triply as a result. I am convinced that no good would be served by keeping you incarcerated for one minute more than I am required to do by law. Over a million Americans face sentencing every year, and it will be the most important day of their lives. But we don't fully understand the system, how broken it is and what we can do to make it better. I'm Doug Passan. I'm a 25-year criminal defense lawyer and a sentencing expert. My goal is to bring more awareness, more fairness, and more humanity to the sentencing process. So, are you ready? Then let's get set for sentencing. Hey everybody, Doug Passan coming to you from Studio 3553 in Scottsdale, Arizona. Listen, in an ideal world, a correctional system is designed to correct, to fix. Maybe it's to keep a society safe from danger, or maybe it's to deter people from committing crimes, but perhaps most important, the conditions of confinement ideally result in a person coming out better than they went in. And if we can fulfill that mandate to improve an inmate, correct whatever was broken that resulted in them committing the crime in the first place, then society as a whole benefits from the productive, healthy person ready to take their rightful place back in, the, in society. Now, keep in mind, these are our parents, they're our brothers, our sisters, our, our children, our neighbors, our friends. We owe them, no matter what the offense. But here's the problem. The Federal Bureau of Prisons is, it's not an understatement to say deeply, deeply dysfunctional, dangerous and dehumanizing. It's a place where punishment seems to be the one and only goal. And the bigger problem is this raw deprivation that's happening uh, leaves people far worse than when they went in. And guess what? Some people don't even come out. They get killed. They have a medical emergency and drop dead. They commit suicide. So if we're going to carry on with our little, our lofty goals of operating the so-called greatest system in the world, we have to do better. And that means a ground-up evaluation of how we're treating our nation's prisoners. And most importantly, which is what we're going to do today, we have to convince judges that their sentences need to reflect the terrible dysfunction in the BOP. And that even applies to our clients who go to this so-called country club camp. Right. And so that's a lot of ramp up to in introduce today's incredible guest on set for sentencing. Uh, proud to say a returning champion. Please welcome Walt Pavlo. Hey, Walt, how are you? Great, Doug. Always, always a pleasure. I'm so glad you're back on set for sentencing. So for those of you who do not know or remember Walt, uh, prison consultant extraordinaire, regular contributor to Forbes.com, where he writes primarily about prison issues, BOP issues. His company is called Prisonology. You can find him at prisonology.com. I'm so glad to have him back. This is a little frame of reference, Walt. The last time you were on the show was episode 18, Okay, which is like a year, almost a year and a half ago, it was like September of 22. So this this episode is going to, when it drops, is going to be something like episode 83. All right. So awesome we've, for you. We've come a long way. Um, and of course, you and I have been working together and consulting on cases all the way through, but I'm so glad to have you back. But for those of you who want to hear the last one, episode 18, it was a pretty good one. Uh, it's called. It was called Prison Consultants and the Myth of the Fixer, How to Separate Substance from Snake Oil. And so, you know, the, th the thrust of that was there are, uh, there's a whole kind of cottage industry of prison consultants that have popped up and, and, and some are good and some are not so good. And it's important to know the difference. So if you want to go back in time to uh, September of 22 and spend another hour with Walt, 
I will put that link in the show notes to episode 18. But that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about uh, the BOP. So there was what really motivated, well, there were two things that motivated me to get you back on, Walt. Um, the first was a sentencing that I participated in in the Eastern District of Wisconsin not too long ago, it was in December of last year, where uh, the client had complex post-traumatic stress disorder, autism spectrum disorder, and a host of medical issues. And we engaged the all great familiar faces of prison consultants to help the judge understand how unduly punitive a time in BOP was going to be with someone with those issues, and therefore a mitigated sentence was in order. And we had expert um, Phil Wise, who talked about medical issues. Of course, we had Maureen Baird to talk about autism spectrum disorder and Jan Perdue to talk about autism spectrum disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder and the lack of psychological care that he'll get and the lack of medical care that he'll get. And the judge, it, this is a judge who's been around for a very long time. And I was shocked at his reaction to all of this really mountain of information. He read it all, very thorough, but what he said was, and here's a quote, when it comes to the Bureau of Prisons and the comments from Janet Perdue and Philip Wise, I can tell you these are matters best left for the Bureau of Prisons to address. And he went on to say, and the Judges are not in the business of dealing with medical issues. And I appreciate you're pulling all this together, but it's more appropriate for those that will be overseeing Mr. D whether in the context of something other than a term of incarceration, whether supervised release or the Bureau of Prisons. So basically he said, that's really interesting stuff, but it's not my problem. The BOP can handle it. And that's what we're talking about today, Walt. Uh, you know, what would be your response to that if you were there? If you could actually just sit down and have a respectful conversation with a judge who 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 has an opinion like this and says, "Don't worry, the BOP can handle it." What do you say? There, there was a, it reminds me of a great quote I once heard from Jed Rakoff, great judge of the Southern District of New York. He 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 was famous for quoting at sentencing. He's like, "If there's any day that you need someone to be your ally." And to tell you everything is going to help me change my mind or influence me, it's on a day of sentencing. And you need character references. You need to tell them about yourself because that's the first time you're presented as a human being, right? I mean, everything else is just a charge. You're a number. You're a docket. This is what you did. It's very sterile, right? But when it comes to sentencing, and thankfully so in, in, in our system, it is not very sterile. It's quite messy and complicated. There's kids there. There's family issues. There's drug and abuse. There's past sexual trauma. There's post-traumatic stress. All these different things that come into sentencing that absolutely do play a part. And, you know, to the judge that you're speaking of, I mean, the Bureau of Prisons has a tough enough time taking care of the 35-year-old with a family and you know, perfect life, they have a tough time taking care of that guy, mm -hmm. <laughs> much less somebody mm -hmm. who's has issues or, you know, or, or, or family issues or mental issues and stuff. And to me, those mm -hmm. definitely need to be brought to the forefront of, of, you know, what it means to, you know, send it somebody to something that's fair. Yes. And so, so basically we have to educate these judges, but in order to do that, I need to educate the attorneys because my goal is to motivate every attorney to raise BOP issues in every case. Until that day comes when the BOP fixes the dysfunction, the, the degradation, the dehumanization, the chaos, um, it's our job to raise this in every single case. So the, you know, the comments from the judge in the Eastern District of Wisconsin motivated me to this is a really, we just got to keep banging this drum. But there were two other things recently that really dovetail perfectly into this issue. Um, one is there was a recent 60 Minutes piece with the director of the federal BOP, Colette Peters. So I want to dig into you with, with that because I know you saw it. I know you have a lot of thoughts about that. And then there was a really kind of a really 
big deal uh, judicial opinion that came out of the Southern District of New York District Court. The judge's name is Judge Furman. And it was quintessentially a conditions of confinement opinion. Um, and it, the only difference is it dealt with pretrial conditions of confinement. It wasn't exactly the same as what we're talking about, which is raising this as a sentencing issue. But the underlying facts and rationale are a thousand percent uh, applicable to what we're talking about today. So so those are the two big things I want to talk about for the next while with you, Walt. Um, give me your just your initial impressions. Uh, I know a lot of us saw the 60 Minutes piece. What did you think? Well, I, you know, first of all, we've never seen anything like it. I, I don't know of any other Bureau of Prisons, you know, a director who's invited people into prison and talking about the prison issues. For that, a plus. Yeah, they, hats they, off. No, hats off. You good good for you. The only other time I've seen something inside of a federal prison was when Obama took a, a visit into um, I believe it was El Reno and walked around and everybody was like, Oh my goodness, there's a president in a in a prison, you know, which I thought was a good thing to remove the stigma um associated with it. But you know, and he had the same things. He was interacting and just like the director, same sort of thing. They these are people and they want to come out. Yeah, You know, but I had to think, Doug, after looking at it, was this, this certainly wasn't the Bureau of Prisons idea. And what I thought is that 60 Minutes was digging into a piece on the Bureau of Prisons and they were going to do it. And they invited the director to come on. And then I figured she, you know, she probably said, I'm damned if I do, I'm damned if I don't. Yeah, right. And, um, you know, if to, after, you know, the summary is, damned if you do is, is what is what it looked like to me i mean i just i just think that it was not a good look not as well prepared as she should have been and really good motivate you know it's sort of like you know the the bar stool chat of what she wants to do is 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 great it's like wow this you you're really going to do something but you got to do something yeah and i just you know I, that part seems to be a challenge for her and yeah and, you know, maybe it's just why do you think yeah. that is? Because I, I do want to believe I mean, she had a reputation as a reformer in state of Oregon, and she was brought in ostensibly to reform. She's not it's not happening. What do you think's going on that's making it so difficult for her to make change? It seems to me that she she doesn't have a handle on the the job and, and a lot of facts and, and really when you when you have facts and you can speak to numbers, I think it backs people off to where they say, hey, I respect what you're going to say. Mm -hmm. But when somebody asks you that you have a staffing shortage, as they did in 60 minutes, mm -hmm. and they said, well, how many people do you have? And she says, I don't know, but I'll know in October of 2024. Yeah, yes, that's just yes. not that's just not a good answer. Yeah. I mean, throw out a number, you know, yeah. because th this the, the, the next cutaway to that was the former union president who I believe came up with a, a hyper inflated number. 8,000. Like, he said 8,000. 8, okay. Is that, is that right? I, I don't think that that's right. I mean, you know, 8,000 represents the number at the peak of the BOP when they had, you know, all these facilities and 200 and some thousand inmates. And now we're yeah. down to 150. So yeah. a lot, a lot has changed. And and by the way, eight thousand wasn't the number that they need overall. Eight thousand, he said, is how short they are. They're short about eight thousand positions nationwide. Correct. Is what this this gentleman Shane Fossey, I think, was. Uh, yeah. So so yeah. that was a so that was a bad look. And all she had yeah. to do was come up with a, a number. And and I think if you would ask me what the number is based on kind of inside baseball things that I think it's probably between three and five thousand something around that range, you know, would be, it certainly that would be better than where we are today. Cause we yeah. know we don't have enough, yeah. you know, anything's yeah. a plus. So um, listen think, now, but let's put a fine point on that because if we're giving practice pointers to defense lawyers to raise these issues, staffing is massive. It may be the biggest one because you can't run a facility in any meaningful way without staff. And that is what causes bad things to happen. It's what causes no supervision, no safety, no medical 
uh, care, no psychological care. Um, and, and they talked about in the 60 minutes piece, this concept of, I love this word. They have these lovely innocuous sounding words for everything. Augmentation. Augmentation. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'll have a bottle of augmentation, please. Yeah. And so people need to understand how deadly that word really is. It means that we don't have enough guards, people to help the inmates. So we're taking people like teachers and medical staff, psychological staff off of their duties, their very, very crucial, important duties and saying, um, yeah, you need to go watch the inmates because we don't have enough guards. Right. What What could go wrong? A lot, a lot. And that, you know, they, they have not addressed that problem. Augmentation is an issue today. The New York Times did a great article. What is it? Two years ago, maybe three years ago, maybe five years. I can't remember. You know, time starts going by, but mm -hmm. they had a great article about, you know, now counselors or, you know, or, you know, psych psychiatric, you know, folks are, are making rounds. Um, you know, doctors are walking the range. I mean, the, the, that's been going on for years and nothing's really happened on that. And that's a that's a big problem. And to your point about what attorneys need to know, you know, when somebody is taken out for medical leave in, you know, in medical and they're taken to a hospital, and a lot of times people don't realize the BOP has a huge healthcare system of trying to take care of these uh, of, of prisoners. They have to typically take them outside. And when you take them outside, just as a member of the public, you don't want a person in a BOP, you know, fatigues for, a, a, you know, a prisoner walking around the lobby, you know, unchaperoned. So you have to have guards. Get one to two guards for everybody that's out there. You could have five if you if you have five people in the hospital, you probably got 10, 10 prison officers that are sitting on these guys. So why is there augmentation? Because there's nobody watching the guys back at the main house. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, psychiatry and all these other people have to get involved that really want nothing to do with this. That's not their job. And you got to think, Doug, when they do get to their job, but they've been working range, walking ranges and doing counts. How good of a job are they going to do in the job that they're supposed to be doing? And that that you know th those are really difficult issues. And let and, you know let's well and by the way the just you know I know I'm bouncing back and forth, but I mentioned already this great great opinion, and I'll put a link in the show notes to this. It's called U.S. v. Chavez, Judge Furman. But that issue of staffing shortages was probably the most important piece of the puzzle for this judge who basically the issue was the client was in custody pretrial in a uh, pretrial detention facility, but it's MDC, which you, you're very familiar with. It's, it's a BOP run facility. So it's in the BOP constellation of institutions. And he says, this judge said the only way to mitigate the ongoing tragedy, he called it a tragedy, which in that instance, he was really talking about the gross understaffing. He says the only way to mitigate the ongoing tragedy, mitigate, did you hear that word mitigate, by the way, mm -hmm. um, is to improve the ratio of correctional officers to prisoners by reducing or at least not adding to the prisoner population. That's what he said, that if they are so understaffed, we simply have an obligation as judges to give them less business, to make their jobs easier so they can do their jobs well. And even Colette Peters in that 60 Minutes interview, she said, quote, we have to send fewer people to prison for shorter periods of time. And then when they when they're here, do things like this. She was referring to the lovely programming at this facility. Um, was it Lucyville? Luce, Luce? Aliceville. Aliceville. Alice, Lucy. Yeah, Alice. In, the I knew it was of, a in the middle of nowhere, Alabama, which yeah. a lot of people would like to live there, but you yeah. might not want to be incarcerated. Yeah. There. Yeah. So this is what we need to emphasize. Fewer people should be going to prison and they should be going for shorter periods of time. And when they're there, they need to have meaningful programming that is straight from the director of BOP's mouth. We need to be quoting her in every 
single motion. Now, let me just make this real for you. you tell, tell me, let's tell, let's do horror store swapping here. I'll go and then you go and we'll see how far we can get. Hey, but before, just, before we go to that, let me just say yeah. something about MDC Brooklyn. Just real yeah, quick to please. close that out. Because it's a, because it's a hell hole. It's a hell hole. But here, here's, here's what's interesting, Doug, about why it's a, you know, a, about that hell hole. It, it cut off the electricity and heat to inmates during one of the coldest days in New York. It led oh to civil, God. it led to a civil action against the Bureau of Prisons, for which they've eventually settled and had to pay the inmates who were who were in there. But it was also overseen as a mediator by a former attorney general, Loretta Lynch, during this mm -hmm. period of time to try to bring people together. How do we fix MDC Brooklyn? So the focus was clearly on an institution like MDC Brooklyn. It's in New York. There's a lot of eyes on it. All the judges are looking at it. You've got a former attorney general looking at this issue. You had David Patton, one of the great you know, federal defenders in the United States, um, who at the time was pushing this. And still today, just you know, within the last month, the Judge Furman puts this out there. Yeah. Even with that focus on it, it's still messed up. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. I mean, his you know, opinion that... was January 4th at issue 2024. Yeah. So, yeah, it, this is right now, right now. And, and, and he talked not only about understaffing in there, but he talked about the excessive lockdowns. So prisoners yes. are locked down. He talked about a gross lack of medical care. He talked about how dangerous it is, how there were at least three suicides, how there's a flow of drugs, uh, phones, other contraband. He talked about infrastructure issues, which yeah. was like mold, contaminating drinking water, like mouse feces, rats, roaches. He definitely talked about the power outages that you talk about. And and guess what? I've heard complaints to varying degrees about all of those things in all the institutions. Right. Across BOP. This is not just that's MDC a, it, problem. No, that's exactly where I was going with this, though, Doug. That's exactly right. So even with MDC, where you can, it, it, first of all, it's, it's compared, it's not a sprawling complex. It's a building, right? It's not like you have to all this, you know, vast land about it. Even with all the focus on it and all the resources that the BOP knew that they were under, they still can't fix it, even with all that pressure and stuff. So what about the other 121 facilities that they have out there? What do you think those, you know, how do you think Yazoo City, Mississippi is run? Forest mm. City, Arkansas. I mean, you know, Aliceville, Alabama. You know, mm -hmm. if you know, th these aren't in the spotlight, and there's nobody complaining about the, you know, the, you know, there's people complaining, but there's not as much focus as there was. And that to me is the real it tells you what's going on in the BOP. If they can't take care of what I consider center stage, something that they could fix and at least mask like all the other institutions look like that. They can't. It really tells you it's like all the other institutions do look like MDC Brooklyn. That's exactly yeah. what they're like, yeah. no matter what resources you tend to throw at them. Yeah. And hats off to Judge Furman because he understands this is a judge's problem. It uh, is a judge's problem. And I, that before, when you sent me, you know, some things that we were going to talk about, that, that is the one thing, you know, when you're talking about mitigation and attorneys, judges just don't know. And they, they need to be in, informed about this. I mean, to me, like prisons are, you know, judges are the front desk of the hotel, albeit not a nice hotel. <laughs> and they keep they keep checking people in and saying, hey, yo, you go to this room for X amount of time and you go to that room for Y amount of time. With, they don't ever look, you think a judge ever looks at like, how are the population statistics in the BOP? How are they running operations or anything? They just keep sending them in. They don't, they don't really look at, and they really should be looking at, you know, what are the conditions that I'm sending this in when there are alternatives, right? There, there you know, home confinement is an alternative. You know, mm -hmm. there's there's split sentences and going to halfway houses. That's an alternative. There's there are plenty of alternatives. For whatever reason, they don't want to use them. Yeah. You know, and and we've done a lot of episodes just on the recent changes to the guidelines. And I would I think the sentencing commission would agree with you there too that we are trying to turn our focus to alternatives and and lower sentences and reducing the population and if, if it hasn't been abundantly clear the argument that you're making is judge 
the sentence that you are about to impose is going to be so overly punitive that it's greater than necessary to meet the goals of sentencing. And, um, you know, in this Furman opinion, he judge said something pretty interesting because I, I want to make sure lawyers, a lot of times they're naysayers and they're like, I don't think my judge would go for that. Uh, I don't think that's persuasive or what, whatever else. If you look in the Furman opinion, um, he says basically that uh, he, uh, let me just see this. Um, bup, 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 bup. And, but, but, oh, all right. Judge Furman says, quote, it's gotten to the point that it is routine for judges in both this district, which is Southern District of New York, and the Eastern District to what? To give reduced sentences to defendants based on the conditions of confinement in the MDC. And they cite to a bunch of cases supporting that, but there was one case called U.S. v. Days from 2019, and this is what that judge says. And, and this is, to, again, to inspire you, defense lawyers, you can make these arguments and you can win on them. This is what the judge said, quote, it is the finding of this court that the conditions to which the defendant was sub subjected are as disgusting, inhuman as anything I've heard about any Colombian prison, but more so because we're supposed to be better than that. I think you've suffered triply as a result. I am convinced that no good would be served by keeping you incarcerated for one minute more than I am required to do by law. That's the heart and soul of the argument right there. Yeah. Right, right on. Yeah, that, that's definitely that. Anytime you're, and look, anytime you're talking, this is just another, maybe a lighter topic, but anytime you're talking at a sentencing about anything under than the underlying conduct is probably a good investment of time. Yeah. Right? Well, you know? yeah, that's true. Uh, that's true. I mean, we, we love to tell a, a good, compelling story around the offense conduct, but these, but that is just one small sliver. And this right. is a big part of it. And um, especially when your client has special needs, medical, psychological, age, those types of things, the every minute of every hour of day is going to be exponentially more punitive yep. for your client. Therefore, a lower sentence or no sentence, hopefully, is is the the just result. And so, um, you know, I guess I do want to make this real for people, just give some concrete examples. And it's from small to horrible, you know, um, the horrible would be understaffing and a client has some kind of attack, physical, uh, medical issue. And there's only one guard guarding the entire, you know, dorm or the entire wing. And they don't give the attention in time and the, and the inmate drops dead right there on the floor of the BOP. That that happens. That's yep. happened, right? Um, have you heard about things like that? Positively, I mean, I, I wrote a story that Dick Durbin read um, uh, when he was uh, questioning Michael Carvajal during COVID um, about a guy named Jimmy Monk, and Jimmy had a year and a day sentence, and he died sixty days into that sentence um, from COVID. Now. The other thing that, you know, it says, well, okay, that's tragic. A lot of people died from COVID. This guy was turned away from the, you know, from the doctor like four different times who didn't want to see him because he was potentially infected. You know, it was, it, it was, it, it's unconscionable what happens in these, in, in these prisons, you know, about, about medical care. And, it, and, and they write about it all the time. Office of Inspector General writes about it, poor medical care. You got judges writing about it. You've got, you know, prisoners bring in civil lawsuits. Yeah, you know uh, about it. So there, you know, and you've all... got Walt Pablo writing about it and over I, and, and over gonna... and over again in Forbes. <laughs> and I'm going, and I'm going to keep doing it. But anyway, we got. I want to. I want to hit do our hit list. I want to hear. Yeah. What's your What's your hit list? What's 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 well, riling you up these days? You know, I mean, even the little stuff. So, for example, I I you know I do a lot of cases involving autism spectrum disorder and. That's a whole other topic. We've got podcasts on it. But the point is, is that there are a couple of BOP facilities that a person with autism is likely to be sent for what's called the skills program. So um, one is in Danbury, Connecticut. And I have a client who's from Alaska. And he now resides in the skills program 
in Connecticut. And his mother, who desperately, you know, worries about her autistic son in the BOP, wants to regularly visit him. And in order to do that, they don't have video conferencing. Um, you know, the phone calls are limited. They have that. But in order to visit, she flies from Alaska to Danbury, Connecticut, routinely. And guess what? Half the time she goes, she doesn't even get to see him because they have shorts. They're too short staffed to mm -hmm. run visitation. So she travels, flies the cost, the expense, the time to fly 4,400 miles from Alaska. And they go, meh, we're a little busy. I mean, it's yeah. a, that it sounds like a small thing, but it's actually a huge thing. And it's, it's, and it's, and it's also, Doug, it's also one of the main things that Colette Peters has talked about in the past that counselors and case managers talk about the interaction between family on the outside and the person on the inside leads to greater success when they get mm -hmm. out. Yeah. Now, you know, distance does not make the heart grow fonder. Okay. If you're in prison, you need to see people. Otherwise you become just a burden when you get out. It's like, well, you know, where, where do you fit? We don't even know where you fit in here. And so yeah. when, when I hear a story like that, tragic, because I know the case that you're talking about, and this is, you know, uh, someone with some really heavy mental issues that that the BOP does not have, as you know, a specific program to address his needs. Right. He's sort of being ushered into, well, if they have like a low IQ all. and stuff, we're going to put him over here. But that's not exactly who this guy is, and mm -hmm. um, and those th that's tragic. That and the the visitation thing is very real. Look on the BOP site. You look on there, visitation canceled. Mm -hmm. Could be could be a fight, could be a stabbing, could be a COVID outbreak, could be we don't have enough people, and that's yep. that that is wrong. Yep. That's definitely wrong. Yep. Another example: I have a client who went to a camp. He went in with for a twenty month sentence with severe complex post traumatic stress disorder. And these are issues he's carried with him his whole life and, you know, made very clear to the judge. And the argument to the judge is, you know, he's not going to get any meaningful psychological care when he's going to be placed in an environment that will exacerbate his PTSD. I mean, it's trauma every day in, a, in any facility. And um, we told the judge he's going to be in really, really bad shape no matter where he goes because he's not going to get the help. And lo and behold, he's not getting any meaningful psychological care. And he's being traumatized repeatedly by inmates uh, who, again, there's only one guard that on duty at any given time. So the inmates are running the institution. There's surprising, shocking amount of violence there. Uh, drugs, alcohol, phones, escapes, suicide attempts. Um, that the, there was a high profile case you could talk about another death due to neglect where, uh, you know, guard even went to prison over it, but the, yeah, the, and the other, the other guard committed suicide that, that, that was involved uh, in that case. He had two, it's a tragedy all the way around. You know, I didn't know tragedy. that part. I don't think yeah, there I was two that. people, two people arrested, one committed suicide and the others, you know, still in the throes of the justice system. Yeah, so those are just a couple, you know, incidents of of my, you know, and and in that in that case, we really were proactive in trying to get him some help. He has a wonderful counselor on the outside; they won't give him access to. They said, "Well, we could do group therapy." Well, how do you think that works? Telling a group of inmates who are basically victimizing you and exploiting you as a vulnerable inmate, telling them all your deepest, darkest secrets in. A uh, group therapy setting. Uh, give me a break. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, to your break. point, what to, to your point, one of the things that, that uh, we we were going to talk about here today are, are you know the, the 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 serious situation that's going on in prison camps. First of all, camps used to be camps. Okay, they used to be you know white collar, low level drug offenders who got in trouble and and no more. These are you know understaffed. They're full of cell phones. They're full of contraband. They're full of drugs. They're, you know, they're 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 poorly run. They're poorly managed. They're unsafe. I mean, I believe that they're they're literally unsafe for 
when you're these are minimum security folks, they can be out in the community. I mean, they they have yeah. status to walk out the gate and go mow grass at the little league baseball fields and then come back to the prison. They, you know, there's town drivers that go to Walmart and Home Depot and you know, have a credit card and you know, and you know, buy stuff. They take inmates to the airport. Inmates transfer from one prison to another prison by their wife picking them up or their parents picking them up. Yeah. I mean, this is craziness. And, and yeah. instead, we, we want to put them in these institutions that are falling apart that need to be really the numbers yeah. need to be cut at least in half at camps. Yeah. I yeah. mean, they, they're way too many people in there and they're very difficult. They're hard on people. You know, you didn't even mention it, but I know your case out of Wisconsin, you're talking about that guy was sentenced to four months. OK, yeah. not years, right. months, four months. That's just a, the resources associated with bringing that guy into prison, sending him back out is is taxing to an overburdened system as it is. Mm -hmm. you know, put him on yeah. home confinement, something. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, nowhere does this mis misconception manifest itself more, I think, with judges than in the context of the white collar offender who's headed to a camp. Because not only are judges oblivious to the problems of BOP, but they still maintain this myth of the country club where, you know, I'm gonna give them five, six, 20 months because they're just going to a camp. It's gonna be easy, easy peasy time. That is not true. Mm -hmm. That is not true. And you don't have to look very far to find the, the evidence of that. Um, and, you know, this, this kind of brings up one thing Colette Peter said on 60 Minutes because they kind of led with the question, you know, um, the many people are are in your custody, Director Peters, because of they're there because of horrific crimes. Why do they deserve compassion? Is what the question was. And rather than her say, you know, actually most of the people under my charge are not there because of horrific crimes, she just says. You know, they deserve compassion because they're going to be back in our society someday and I want them to be productive tax paying citizens. So, you know, what is the efficacy of sending truly nonviolent people into this into this the mouth of the wolf like that? And by the way, on the stats, I, of course, I had to reach out to Mark Allenbaugh in preparation for this podcast because I wanted to know, well, how does it break down violent offenses versus nonviolent? And Allenbaugh says the only true violent offenses you know, listed in there are really like the homicides, assaults, kidnapping, and sex offense. Um, those are the ones that would constitute horrific crimes that they talk about. And and those are about six, under 16% of the entire BOP population. The biggest percentage, you know what the biggest percentage of, of inmates' crimes committed are? What crime no. is it? Drug trafficking. Well, drugs. Drug, sure. Drugs. That's nearly half. Nearly half of the BOP population are drug offenses. But see, what you're bringing up right there is exactly what I was th thinking about earlier of where uh, Director Peters has to have command of the numbers. Mm -hmm. Because if somebody says, all oh, these guys are horrific crimes, you know, I'll throw some of that that I just know. 50% of the inmate population in the Federal Bureau of Prisons is low or minimum. Okay, so the, 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 that's just a quick stat. Now, there's some sex offenders, obviously, in you know, in the low, but there's also... Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people that are going to be rejoining and she needs to know, well, what's the average sentence that a person has, you know, in your custody? You know, if you go and look, you know, a lot of the sentences are between five, you know, I would say between five and 10 years, sort of in that, you know, in that, in that range. But she needs to have command of that so that we understand rather than this, it's, it's two 30,000 foot, just kind of dive down a little bit and give us something mm -hmm. because that makes a lot of sense. You know, when you, when you look at it and say, wow, most of the people in the, you know, over half of the Bureau of Prisons is low or minimum security. Wow. Yeah. What's going on with those guys? Yeah. You know, yeah. Worth, worth pursuing. They're not at the ADX. There's some bad guys out there. No doubt right. about it. They're, they're locked up and they're, you know, rightfully so. I mean, you look, I, I lived in Boston, you know, when, when the marathon bomber went down and I was, you know, that's a guy that I do not want to see have another chance. And I'm, sure. I'm a guy that likes to give people a lot of chances, right? No more chances. Small <laughs> sliver. Guy. It's a small, but that, I think that's a takeaway. That's a very small sliver. Very, very Most small. Most of these folks are just like you and me and they're not dangerous people. They've made bad mistakes and, uh, 
they're coming out of this worse than they went in. And by the way, so, you know, when I tell attorneys, this isn't just for sentencing, these are for what we call resentencing, because we have a great opportunity now with compassionate release, right. changes to the compassionate release guidelines, we can raise these issues and essentially get in for a resentencing based on compassionate release. So even if you you know, it's a little hard to say at sentencing, well, I know for sure my client's going to go to X facility, and this is exactly what's happening in X facility. But you can speak in broad strokes about the state of the BOP and the dysfunction and the understaffing and everything else. But when you get to compassionate release, well, you know, you don't have to guess about what their life has been like for them because they've mm -hmm. been there. And you and you need to really flesh that out and, and show that in stark terms to the judge. And that's going to actually work both way on both ends, I think, because I think the more judges see the the reality exposed in a post conviction motion for compassionate release, the more they're going to think about that when it comes time to sentence them in the no, first place. No, very true. And you know, in fact, that you know, you invited me to come up. What are the, what are the things that are pissing me off these days? Yes, okay. Please. So one of them are for elderly offenders. You know, the, the, the Bureau of Prisons had a, uh, you know, there were more particularly with white collar crimes, we're seeing, you know, men and women in their 60s and 70s and 80s yeah. Yeah. being sentenced to prison. And, you know, when you look at somebody, we, we, I just had a client, he was he was 82, he just went into prison and it, yeah, a year and a day and he's and he's going to a medical center. And it's, uh, you know, to me, it's like there's no elderly offender program. There's no way for elderly people to get out earlier to, you know, like there was, there was a program where they could conceivably serve part of their time on home confinement that expired in September. Nothing new has been brought up, although there's legislation, you know, being looked at, but, you know, God knows how long that takes if, if ever, but it's hard for them to participate in programming. Socially, uh -huh. they're, they're exiled. I mean, most mm -hmm. of the guys are running around, Hey, do you want to play basketball? Well, right. you know, this guy's not playing basketball, right? I mean, he's not, he doesn't have much in common. You got an average age of about 35 to 40. This guy's yeah. double their age. You know, you got health care issues. And, and when it comes to putting somebody in a medical center, particularly at sentencing, one of the arguments is I was attorney that was making, if you had, if you don't, don't overplay the medical, but look, if a person is sick enough and they're going to be going to a medical center, they should not be taking up that bed because that bed needs to be taken for a guy who can't get out. Mm -hmm. Maybe he's you know, triple homicide or something. He's moved down from a penitentiary and now he's gone to a hospital. That guy can't go on home confinement. Yep. But but this guy's getting sentenced today to a year and a day. Doesn't need to go to a medical center. You know, he can serve his stuff at home. He's got his own doctors, all this other stuff. That's where judges really, to me, need to look at the data in front of them and say, this is just a, not a smart thing for me to do. This is not the right punishment for this particular guy. Did he do something wrong? He did. I'm going to give him home confinement yeah. you know, for three years or something. Yeah. Something. But there's yep. right now, there's no, elderly offenders warehousing them. They're, they're not eligible usually for halfway house. Who wants a guy in a halfway house? He can't work. Right. You no, know, he's not going to go out to you know work during the day. I mean, all the rules that are that there are for prison, prison are made for young people. That's who uh -huh. usually offends. So now yeah. you got an old guy. What's he going to do? No halfway house. You got to stay yeah. there till your thing is done. Simple things like: Are you going to get a top bunk versus a bottom bunk? I mean, you it, get what, a bunk I, where there's a bunk. And it, Doug, sorry and if I you're 80 and you got to climb up to the top bunk. That's your problem. And 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 politically inside of a prison, th that sucks. A guy comes in off the street and a guy finally gets a bottom bunk. I'm just telling you, like. You know, bottom bunk is prime real estate for a lot of reasons. And when a guy who's 80 comes in and knocks the guy who's 30 who had a bottom bunk, you know, get your, you know, and that's, you know, you got to get your ass out. The guy's not going to get along well with people. Right. You know, he's a pain right. in the ass to the peer inmates as well. Right. So moving be around the facility is tough for an old elderly person. A lot of times they have a set time limit to where they get have to get from point A to point B um, or they get disciplined. And, and how does that work if you've got an arm sack full of laundry or commissary or, or you, know, you got to climb stairs in the facility and everything else? It so. leads it leads to extortion. Every Friendly minute extortion. of every day is excruciating 
for yep. old folks. Yep. Um, well, what else is pissing you off, Walt? <laughs> um, let's see. My other one, let's see. We're, the ha the First Step Act. You know, it's really sort of like the, you know, the Half Step Act. The, the Bureau of Prisons has just done a, a terrible job of implementing it. To, you know, go, you know, going back and forth to our main piece about the 60 minutes thing. This is something Colette Peters could really sink her teeth into. I can't tell you the number of letters that I get from people. I'm being held in prison because I didn't get my first step back. Or the most recently, there's not enough room in the halfway house to let me out. And, and I've talked to the Bureau of Prisons and asked them, do you guys have a halfway house problem? We're at 99% capacity. That's unconscionable for the First Step Act, which forecasted we're going to need more halfway houses, right? Mm -hmm. That's That was five years ago now that um, you know we're going to have this thing. So you would think like, okay, maybe we should start getting more halfway houses or finding out how to better monitor people. Right. And they just have not done it. And they're back. They're they're not doing it. There's a lot of uh, litigation that's going to happen about First Step Act, mostly because they didn't give people enough time. And you know, I, I'm waiting for the class action suit. You know, I mean, this isn't about a person who was held in prison years long, too long, but it is a situation where tens of thousands of people yeah. have been held anywhere from one day to you know six yeah. months or even a year longer than they should have been yeah and i yeah. They, there needs to be class actions the only way they're going to get their shit together and fix it and and yeah. by the way the the client that i referred to earlier he should have been out already to a halfway house but there's no bed space available for yeah. him so he's yeah. still in, in custody and the way the First Step Act, I mean, and the problem is, is just going to get more challenging because what's going to happen is, Doug, we're, we're a 10 year prison sentence for someone who meets the First Step Act requirements is going to end up, you know, being that these people are going to be on home confinement for two or three years. All right. So what are we going to do about that? The First Step Act hasn't been implemented long enough where we have these people with long sentences that are going to start having these longer stays. They're going to earn all these first step back credits that allow them to stay at home long, you know, to serve part of their sentence. How is that going to work? Right. I mean, we, we can't even give guys a couple of weeks now, you know, or, or a couple of more months that they're looking for. How are they going to handle this in, in the next five to 10 years when you have people that are literally going to federal prison and almost half their sentence is going to be served at home. How does that work? They better mm -hmm. be they better be thinking about that right now. Um, the very existence of the First Step Act is is evidence that there's bipartisan support for lower sentences and alternatives yep. to incarceration, but it's not. It's just putting it into effect seems to be very very difficult for these folks. Getting, I thought that the toughest part was having Republicans and Democrats. Agree get along <laughs> to the 80 percent 80 you know it was like it wasn't like it was like 50 50 like everything else it was like a 80 percent of, of of congress in the senate went along with this thing i mean mm -hmm. it was you know especially the time we're looking at saving money and all this other stuff we got a big yeah. but you know all these different things that are going on um the um the other thing that i want to tell you that um is you know that that makes me angry i don't know that there's much we can do about it but I think we should look at it as a lesson is this is this CARES Act, even though it ended, it allowed certain prisoners to serve a percentage, you know, their their time at home, home confinement as a result of COVID-19. Yeah, they had, you know, underlying conditions. And you know what, Doug, it was successful. Yeah, you know, to me, it showed that we can do this and the BOP should get credit for that. Right. There hardly anybody reoffended or did anything wrong most people you know 99 percent finished their sentence and stuff yeah. the bureau of prisons and they had years by the way years left to serve in their sentences in some cases and Correct. they got released to home confinement and it worked out fine and it worked out fine and it didn't take like a long lead time we had covid they yeah. started releasing people yeah you know and these people and it's been successful bop should get total kudos for that mm -hmm. but why they why they can't take that same mentality of the successes that they enjoyed in, in CARES Act and translate it into really pushing people out the door under the First Step Act is really troublesome because 
you would think like, hey, let's build on success. Right. And they just sort of said, well, I guess that program's over with. Let's, you know, what are we going to do now? Does it, you, you know, you, it doesn't seem fair. You'd think that the under the overworked, under resourced staff would be screaming from the rooftops to get more people out of there. So their jobs aren't as horrible. Yeah. I mean, but it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Well, he, here's, I do want to talk, I feel like we're getting close to the end, but I do want to really talk about uh, what I have found to be maybe the biggest obstacle to bringing the issue into focus for judges. And that is the BOP lies. They put up a, a facade, like a smoke screen, like everything's actually quite wonderful here. We We do our jobs super well and i i really just don't know you know what the defense is even complaining about and you know i learned this lesson the hard way the first time many many years ago who i had an elderly client who was being sentenced for a kickback thing in healthcare he was a doctor and he had cancer and we said you like everything we've talked about terrible medical care everything else and they said they do this standard letter saying we are fully equipped to handle any medical emergency and we have the top-notch federal medical center and we're awesome and yeehaw. And uh client was dead within six months. Hmm. Went to Butner and he was dead within six months. And, um, but you know, that letter is standard. I'm sure that any lawyer who gets that letter could point to a thousand cases where that letter was issued and something terrible happened. But the 60 minutes piece was a perfect example which is they went to Aliceville and everything looked wonderful. And the women were doing these great programs and, uh, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, bless their hearts. Those prisoners are brave as fuck because they told the truth to 60 minutes. And they're like, this is all staged. <laughs> they're putting on a show for you. This, yeah. this is not good in here. There's not, this is not good in here. Um, and this is exactly what happens every time we as defense lawyers trying to challenge the reality of the ground inside the BOP. They put on a big old show, a little dog and pony show. And so the question is, how do you get how do you break through that wall, Walt? Well, I, I do think that you, you bring up a really great point. The BOP does put together a standard letter. In fact, I had worked with Maureen on a case one time and we we had, it, 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 it was we had another case that she had worked on. But they the government also provided their letter to say, you know, you're the one that you would gave example of, oh, we have six medical centers and 400 professionals and all this other shit. So, but there was the same typo in that letter as the one is in the other letter <laughs> from a completely different client. And we were mm -hmm. able to point that out. But I will say this, what's important for attorneys to know in, you know, even your client about, you know, about the cancer or, you know, or anything like that, it is important to have somebody lay the groundwork for the concerns that you might have for what someone's going to encounter when the BOP, and maybe it doesn't get them out of going to prison or, you know, it doesn't help. But I tell you what, if you come back for compassionate release, hmm. that can help yeah. because you could say, judge, remember all that so. stuff that I told you, this is exactly what happened. And this mm -hmm. is what's going on. And you didn't believe me then. But you should believe me now because now I've yeah. done it. And I also tell clients when they're going in, document everything. Yes. You want to put in cop outs, do electronic emails, whatever it is. I'm sick today. My side hurts. My head hurts. Whatever it is, you're not going to be a pain in the ass. Document it or else your attorneys don't have you know shit to work with. Yes. Um, but you can, and you, you know, you can definitely when you're going in, if you don't get the mitigation, just realize game ain't over. Right. You know? You know, you still got another shot at it down down the way. And I think being able to walk in with that declaration or your, you know, what you had told the judge, extremely mm -hmm. powerful when you're looking at it. Because yeah. I will tell you this, Doug, BOP is going to fail. <laughs> okay. They're not, you know, That's no one's going to, no, I've yet to have one guy come in and said, hey, man, the health care I got in there was unbelievable. You know, they treated me great. They did this. They did that. Not had that one yet, but. Right. And, and I'll tell you what, documentation is a great, great, great piece of advice. Uh, cannot stress it enough. Sometimes, though, lawyers, you're going to have to build out the case um, outside of your client, you know, because a lot of times your client has, you know, 
only so much credibility with the court and they may be saying X, Y, and Z, but of course the BOP is saying, oh no, it's great. It's totally great. And who do you think they're going to believe? Your client or the BOP? And mm -hmm. so at that point, you really got to dig in and do some work to find some other people or documentation to corroborate the claims that you're making. Um, sometimes you can get affidavits or declarations from other inmates who yeah. don't have a dog in the fight, but they can back up everything that they're saying. Sometimes there's going to be documentation. Sometimes there's already civil lawsuits that are being filed against the same facility and there are lawyers that are much further down the road than you yeah. are about gathering, building a case. Correct. So you really got to kind of dig for that stuff. It's not easy, especially in the face of this facade that they put up. And by the way, back to 60 Minutes, the most offense, I think the most offensive part of this, you know what I'm going to say, right? Mm -hmm. The sex abuse allegation. No, no, no apology. Yeah. Not only no apology, <laughs> but she says it's all good. That uh, that was really bad. What happened in Dublin, in California, which affectionately was called the Rape Club. Right. But she says, you know, it's all fixed. No threat remains. It's all good. She goes, this is her quote. We've done a tremendous job in the last year rebuilding that culture and creating an institution that's more safe where individuals feel comfortable coming forward and reporting claims. And um, hats off to the interviewer because she said, you just said tremendous job, but eight there's eight inmates that have filed a class action lawsuit that um and they've gotten testimony from more than 40 current and former dublin inmates who say that the abuse is ongoing hey you know doug i had actually talked to two women who've left federal prison and i'll keep this short because i i i also want you to have these folks on your your show oh, um but they were tell they were telling me about the abuse that goes on but it's it's very interesting what they said and um what they tell me is, Walt, have you ever been to a visiting room in prison? And I have. I've visited plenty of guys in prison and men, I will say all men. And she says, how was the how was the the the, the room? And I said, it was, you know, it's usually packed. She said, have you ever visited a woman in prison? And I said, no, and she says, it's empty. Because men, as a general rule, the only people that visit women are their closest family or their parents that are bringing kids. There's very few men in their life. And they say that, so when you go to a visiting room, guards see your vulnerability. Nobody's visiting you. Nobody loves you. Nobody cares for you. And so these encounters, they're called rape, often happen because the woman too is, they're, they're just, you're, you're putting people in just a, a, a situation where they're going to fail. Yeah. And the guards see it and they see the self-esteem going down. And then they, they, the guards they have their own issues at home. And now yeah. this plays out in a prison. It's something that opened my eyes to how deep the problem is. You just can't say, Hey, no sex in the prison. Mm -hmm. you're, you're dealing with something that needs a, a lot deeper look than that. And I'd never even thought about it before until they brought it to my attention. Oh, that's so sad. But yeah, there, there's no such thing as consensual sex in a prison environment. It's rape. Right. Um, it's a power dynamic. And like you said, they're taking advantage. They're preying on their vulnerabilities. And that's yep. pretty damn it, sick. Exactly. And, and by the way, that was another change to the compassionate release guidelines. Being a victim of sexual abuse in prison is now very, very clear, compelling grounds for compassionate release. Yeah. Doug, I'll, I'm going to get, I'm going to give everybody like a preview of something that I've been working on. I Good. get letters, I get letters from prison, and they are cheering me on, but they're saying, "Hey, you got to write about this place." So I'm going to come up with a new thing that I'm going to do. It's called Letters from Prison, and then whatever that institution is, and I'm going to write about what these prisoners are telling me is going on in these prisons, and I'm going to send it to the BOP. So they said, hey, I'd like to get your comment on this. And I'm going to be like the Channel 5 news guy who's, mm. who's going out and saying, hey, this window, you didn't fix the window like you said. What are you going to do about it? And let him, let him have a chance to do it. I so, love it. I love I'm gonna, it. 
I feel I'll like that could there. be an, another podcast episode letter. It could, <laughs> it could be. Let me, I've got to, I, I look over here in the corner. I have a stack of it. I'm trying to figure out what the hell do I do with all these things? Yeah. You know, I mean, there's, but I, I, I'm, I'm going to do it. I get halfway houses, first step act, residential drug abuse program problems, you know, being thrown out of classes, lockdowns for food, you know, all these different things. And so. Yeah. BOP is going to love you. They're going to, yeah. they're going to have a field day with this one. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I love that you're doing this. I'm so grateful that you're out there doing this work and if people want to find Walt, go to prisonology.com. Of course, I'll have links to you in, in my show notes. I will say that just to circle the square on judge Furman's opinion, again, it's about, it was a pretrial issue, but everything's applicable to this and there's plenty more case law out there. So you have case law, you have news media, NPR has been doing exceptional reporting on the BOP recently, and I think there's more coming. You have experts like Walt, there's um, there's tons of resources that you can muster. Office, Office of Inspector General. OIG go, reports go, are all go, available go. online. Yeah, yeah they, 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 and they just actually came up with a new FOIA, all their FOIA requests. They just, you know, put that out there, government accountability oh, office the congressional right. reports that are out there there's you know there's testimony i mean you know if you want to talk about shortage of staff go to the senate judiciary committee and anything that colette peters has ever said talks about a shortage of staff mm -hmm. right you don't you don't you don't need to go looking yeah. for a bunch of articles just go look at that she's saying it herself yeah you don't want to get you don't need to guess about it and take the words right from colette peters mouth we have to send fewer people to prison for shorter periods of time. That's a quote. That's a verbatim quote. Use it. And yeah. if, as far as the compassionate release goes, you know, would they expanded it to basically uh, there's a catch all, meaning if you can convince a judge that there are, quote, extraordinary and compelling, end quote, reasons for compassionate release, the judge has the discretion to do compassionate release. And I thought it was interesting because in Judge Furman's opinion, the statute he was looking at as to whether he could keep this guy out pretrial um, created an exceptional, if, if, there were ex if there were exceptional reasons to release them, he could. And to me, that, that was an analogous argument, exceptional reasons to deviate from whatever. It's, it's the same argument, essentially. These are extraordinary and compelling reasons, and we must use them, and we must not take the BOP at their word. Judges, you need to understand the BOP is lying to you when they say, we got this. We got this. It's all good. It's not all good. Yeah. So I guess we could leave it there, but I will say uh, prisonology.com, Walt Pablo. I'm going to put links to some of his great articles in the show notes and everything else. You can go to setforsentencing.com, pull up the episode, and and all, all kinds of resources we'll put We'll put there. And if you're having good luck with these arguments at sentencing, I want to hear from you. If you're having bad luck with these arguments at sentencing, I want to hear from you. <laughs> Reach out. Let's 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 start documenting this stuff. Let's start building a database and resources. Um, and let's get it done. Thank you, Walt, so much for doing this again. Thank you. Thank you. Always a pleasure, Doug. That's it for today, but before we go, I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you. To you, the listener, for spending time with us today getting set for sentencing. Whether you're a lawyer, someone who could use the help, or maybe you're just a true crime buff who loves the inside scoop on how this whole thing works, I am so glad you're here, and I hope you keep listening. If you're interested in knowing more about what I do, mitigation videos, case consults, live teaching, on-demand educational content, books, articles, all of it, please visit www.dougpassonlaw.com. I'm Doug Passon. Until next time, hang in there. Wait a minute, that's a stupid way to sign up a podcast about sentencing. Hang in there. What's the matter with you, man? I guess they call that gallows humor. Sorry. All right. Well, I will see you next time on Set for Sentencing. Bye-bye.